please join me in the call to worship? From every direction we come and gather. No matter who we are or where we are we come, or from where we come, God meets us in this place. God meets us in the eyes of the stranger sitting next to us and in the wonder of children's whispers. Led by the Spirit, let us be present to the community we create. We are here. Help us to listen to the grounds in our midst, O oh God. Creation's grounds of labor pains, our neighbor's grounds of loneliness, the grounds that we bring with trepidation and awe. We come bringing all of our yearnings that are on our hearts this day, and we know that you need us wherever we are. Thank you for your ever-constant presence and companionship along life's journey. We know that with you, we are never alone. Amen. As we stand before God, let's join together in our statement of faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is created, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in
I've been here long enough to remember him when he was a kid. He plays for the Shelby County Line Band now. You can see him different uh, restaurants and places they play now. And we're happy. But there he plays, uh, I think, the bass guitar. Am I not coming through? That's why I'm not. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, we have a blessing this morning. Toby Turner. Where are you, Toby? Kevin and Amy, come on up. Now, this is a special blessing today, and this has happened before because they have three other children, but we've become very aware of this since we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of this church building here. And what I became more aware of this morning was folks really began using this building in 1915. And Ray, the great-grandfather of these children who is here with us, was baptized in this building in 1918. And so Ray's here with us, and we have four generations in church this morning for this baptism. Isn't that not cool? Yeah, that's cool. They were bringing children to Jesus 
that Jesus might touch them and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, Jesus was indignant and he said, let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the realm of God. And truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the realm of God like a child shall not enter it. And Jesus took them in his arms, laying his hands upon them and blessed them. Jesus said, unless we are born anew, we cannot see the reign of God. And unless we are born of water and the spirit, we cannot enter God's new order. Paul the Apostle said, all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were also baptized into Christ's death. We were buried, therefore, with Christ by baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of God, we too might walk in newness of life. The sacrament of baptism is an outward and a visible sign of the grace of God. And inasmuch as the promise of the gospel is not only to us, but it is also to our children, baptism with water and the Holy Spirit is the mark of their acceptance into the care of Christ's church, the sign and seal of their participation, excuse me, in God's forgiveness, and the beginning of their growth into full Christian faith and discipleship. This water has three drops of water in it for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those three drops of water came from the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized. This is the water of baptism. And out of this water we rise with new life, forgiven of sin and one in Christ, members of Christ's body. I have some questions to ask you. Kevin and Amy, will you encourage this child to renounce the powers of evil and to receive the freedom of new life in Christ? If so, say we will with the help of God. Will you teach this child that he may be led to profess Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior? If so, say we will with the help of God. Do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciples, to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice? and to witness to the work and the word of Jesus Christ as best you are able, if so say we do with the help of God. Do you promise, according to the grace given you, to grow with this child in the Christian faith, to help this child to be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ by celebrating Christ's presence, by furthering Christ's mission in all the world, and by offering the nurture of the Christian Church so that he may affirm his baptism, if so say we do with the help of God. Jesus calls us to make disciples of all nations and to offer them the gift of the grace and baptism. Do you who witness and celebrate this sacrament promise your love, support, and care to the one about to be baptized as he lives and he grows in Christ? If so, please say, we promise our love, support, and care. Then let us unite with the church in all times and places in confessing our faith in the triune God. People of St. Paul's Church, do you believe in God? If so, say, I believe in God. I believe in God. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? If so, say, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? If so, say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Then let us pray together. We thank you, God, for the gift of creation called forth by your saving word. Before the world had shape and form, your spirit moved over the waters and out of the waters of the deep. You formed the firmament and brought forth the earth to sustain all life. In the time of Noah, you washed the earth with the waters of the flood and your ark of salvation bore a new beginning. In the time of Moses, your people Israel passed through the Red Sea waters from slavery to freedom and crossed the flowing Jordan to enter the promised land. And in the fullness of time, you sent Jesus Christ who was nurtured in the water of Mary's womb. Jesus was baptized by John in the water of the Jordan, became living water to a woman at the Samaritan well, washed the feet of the disciples, sent them forth to baptize all nations by water and the Holy Spirit. Bless by your Holy Spirit, gracious God, this water. By your Holy Spirit, save those who confess the name of Jesus Christ, that sin may have no power over them. Create new life in the one baptized this day, that he may find joy in the service of Jesus Christ, his Savior. Glory to you, eternal God, the one who was and is and always shall be, world without end. By what name do you call this big boy? Toby Earl. Okay. Toby Earl Turner, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit.
Oh God, we praise you for Toby and for all of our children in this church. We ask for your blessing over him as he grows stronger in faith. Be close to his parents and help them to guide him in ways that he should go. May he know your love. May he know the power of your spirit in his life and raise him up to be a man of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Toby. Cameras, here I am. Okay, Grandpa. You got it? <laughs> there we go. All right. All set. Why don't you come down and join me? Okay, I see where they are. Some gifts for you are coming. go some things for Toby to wear and enjoy and to help you out and somebody take the rose to celebrate Toby's day here and you can have Toby back now and then of course you got a stack of these one for each one you guys got your own too don't you they're come yeah. and you know what's in there the cradle cross Put it on the wall above his crib so he sees the cross of Christ every day of his life. May God's blessings be with you. Go raise your child in peace. The Old Testament reading comes from uh, the book of Psalms. Um, Psalm 86, verses 11 through 17. Teach me, Lord, what you want me to do, and I will obey you faithfully. Teach me to serve you with complete devotion. I will praise you with all my heart, O Lord my God. I will proclaim your greatness forever. How great is your constant love for me. You have saved me from the grave itself. Proud people are coming against me, O God. A cruel gang is trying to kill me people who pay no attention to you. But you, O oh Lord, are a merciful and loving God, always patient, always kind and faithful. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Strengthen me and save me, because I serve you just as my mother did. Show me proof of your goodness, Lord. Those who hate me will be ashamed when they see that you have given me comfort and help. And from Paul's letter to the Romans, um, chapter 8, verses 12 through 25. So then, my friends, we have an obligation, but it is not to live as our human nature wants us to. For if you live according to your human nature, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death your sinful actions, you will live. Those who are led by God's Spirit are God's children. For the Spirit that God has given you does not make you slaves and cause you to be afraid. Instead, the Spirit makes you God's children, and by the Spirit's power we cry out to God, Father, my Father. God's Spirit joins himself to our spirits to declare that we are God's children. Since we are his children, we will possess the blessing he keeps for his people, and we will also possess with Christ what God has kept for him. For if we share Christ's suffering, we will also share his glory. I consider that what we suffer at this present time cannot be compared at all with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. All of creation waits with eager longing for God to reveal his children. For creation was condemned to lose its purpose, not of its own will, but because God willed it to be so. Yet there was hope, the hope that creation itself would one day be set free from its slavery to decay and would share the glorious freedom of the children of God. For we know that up to the present time, all of creation groans with pain, like the pain of childbirth. But it is not just creation alone which groans. We who have the Spirit as the first of God's gifts also groan within ourselves as we wait for God to make us his children and set our whole being free. For it was by hope that we were saved. But if we see what we hope for, then it is not really hope. For who of us hopes for something we see? But if we hope for what we do not see, 
We wait for it, for it with patience. Mark 8, verse, uh, verses 31 through 38. Mark 8, verses 31 through 38. Then Jesus began to teach his disciples, the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. He will be put to death, but three days later he will rise to life. He made this very clear to them. And so Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But Jesus turned around, looked at his disciples, and rebuked Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. Your thoughts don't come from God, but from man. And then Jesus called the crowd and his disciples to him. If anyone wants to come to me or with me, he told them, he must forget himself and carry his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his own life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Does a person gain anything if he wins the whole world, but he loses life? Of course not. There is nothing he can give to regain his life. If a person is ashamed of me and of my teaching in this godless and wicked day, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. These are the words of our blessed Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Glory. Peace of God be with you. Yes. Greet one another.
Good morning. I have someone that you all just have to meet. Her name is Scuba Duba Dive, and she's a scuba diving dog. Let me call her. Scuba! Scuba Duba Dive, where are you? Maybe you all can help me. Everybody, on the count of three, we'll all yell together, Scuba Duba Dive, where are you? Ready? stubborn this morning. All right, ready? One, two, three. Scuba Duba Dive! Where are you? I hear something. Huh. Is she coming down from the ceiling? Oh, there she is. I thought you were looking forward to your dive. Well, I was, but I think I'm getting a little bit nervous. Ah, come on, Scuba. You and your friends have faced lots of danger when you solved mysteries. You're a dive hound, not a scaredy cat. Hey, watch who you're calling a cat. I'm not scared. I'm just, well, I'm sure. Unsure of what? fish. <laughs> oh, Scuba, the ocean is wonderful. There are beautiful, amazing things under the sea. Hey, kids, what can Scuba expect to see on, his, on her dive? Maybe some sharks, Brian. Some fish, Brett. Coral. Emily. Some more fish, Josie. Jellyfish. Is it peanut butter and jellyfish? Yeah? No. Rebecca. Oh, crabs. Addie. Lobster. Whale. Maybe some whales. Ty. Stingrays. Beckett. A boat underwater. Oh, good thought. That's a new one. Hey, listen to that, Scuba. These kids haven't been these kids haven't been deep sea diving diving either, but they believe that the underwater world is wonderful. It's like that with God. We can believe in God even though we can't see him. Oh yeah. Believe in God. I can't really see God, but I sure know that he's there and I know God is wonderful. That's the idea. Now run off and join your dive class. The kids and I have some exploring to do ourselves. We're all in for quite an adventure. And that is how we began. Oh, yes, everybody wave to Scuba Duba Die. Bye, Scuba. There I go. Goodbye. It was awesome how that worked out. 
We had skits for the beginning of um, Vacation Bible School for the four days where we were here. And it was actually entitled Scuba Dooba Doo. Well, we just happened to have our lovely Di, Anne, who scuba dives, so <laughs> it was a natural. So we thank Diane for um, interacting with us all four days of Bible school. I think that was probably one of the kids' favorite things, most memorable things, um, was Scuba Duba Die. She, she did a great job with our skits. Um, while the kids are going to go up on stage, we're going to sing you one song from Vacation Bible School. So you guys can go on up, and I'm going to keep talking. Imagine that. Younger ones in front, short, or shorter ones in front, taller ones in back. You guys know the drill. Hey, Caleb, you guys scoot this way. Scoot away from the CD player. Scoot, scoot this way a little bit more. Bunch in together there. We don't need to be too spread out. If you had a hand in this very successful and wonderful Bible school this week, would you please stand? Yes. It was an amazing week. And we have some amazing people and amazing helpers. You should have seen the delight on the kids' faces all week long. Um, it, it just it couldn't have been any happier and so thankful. It makes me cry to have such wonderful support and to have such wonderful people willing to help um, in this experience that we had at our church. We had about, where's Jane, what, 65 kids or so? We had about... Yes, we had about 65 kids, some were helpers, some were sixth graders who wanted to come back, and we had about 10 of those show up every single day, and then along with our adult helpers as well. So, um, like I said, thank you for your support of our, our Vacation Bible School. And now we have a song for you. Um, it kind of sums up all the things we talked about during Vacation Bible School. Who can tell the congregation the first day that we came, we talked about Elijah. And what did Elijah teach? What was the one word that we needed to remember? Bryn, to believe, to believe in God. And then we talked about Jonah. Brooke, what did Jonah teach us? To obey. So we talked about believing and obeying. And then we moved on to the New Testament. And Jesus and his disciples were out on the water, and they were frightened of the storm. The disciples were frightened. What did Jesus teach them? What is that word, Tyler? To trust. Yes, to trust in God. And the last day, I'll get you, Brett. We talked about Jesus and his disciples, and what did he ask them to do? What, was the, what did he ask them to do, Brett? He asked them to share God's love. So those were our four days of themes of Bible school. And our, our song here kind of encompasses each and every one of those. So bear with me just a second.
a lot of fun. It was a great, great week, and uh, it was supposed to finish with a pool party, but it got too cold Thursday night to do that, so they rescheduled that for, uh, I think it was August 4th that night. 9.30 to 11 that night, I suppose, the time. Well, I hope what I have to share with you today will give you strength and lead you forward in the days ahead. A lot of unusual spiritual energy is floating around these days. If it were tapped, such energy could cause great and lasting transformation in our world, really. It could cause it to happen in individual lives and communities and even in the nations of the world. And you know with what's going on in the world that something has to happen. And those transformations begin when we each one decide how we will focus the unused spiritual energy that remains untapped within each one of us. Now let me illustrate God's answer to this issue using a very simple fuse. You know, the little tiny fuses. Most of us don't have them in our, in our electrical systems now, but they were little tiny fuses that you had to change all the time. In any electrical system where a fuse is used, the fuse plays a major role in the operation of the system. And usually, you don't even know that the fuse is there unless something goes wrong. And then the fuse plays an important role by giving up its own life. The fuse, in essence, dies for the good of the whole. It keeps the electrical system from burning up and setting a fire to everything around it. It isn't losing its life then that the fuse finds its purpose. How does a fuse work? It's a simple conductor of electricity from one wire to another. And within the housing of the fuse, however, the actual metal that serves as the conductor melts when there is an excessive amount of electrical current flowing into the fuse. And as a result, the circuit shuts down until the problem with the circuit is fixed and a new fuse is introduced. The fuse is simply one with the system, simply working with the whole system, doing its part like it should, doing what is necessary to deliver the power and to keep the system safe. That's how it works. Now let's convert that illustration to what Jesus said. Jesus told his disciples and a crowd that had gathered around that if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and to forfeit their life? I know it's hard for people in our culture to comprehend that a person could really find himself or herself by not putting self first. It is so tempting to believe that investing oneself in ego satisfaction and investing oneself in the hunt for the world's adoration would bring with it a sense of completeness and a sense of fulfillment. But it won't. To those scratching to find success, giving yourself away to serve the needs of others or the cause of the Christ may not sound, after all, like the way to go. If you're trying to get the world's fortunes, if you're trying to get all the toys, if you're trying to be the one who has it all, it doesn't sound like helping people out is going to get you there. The bottom line is that any of us, any of us want to remain safe. But if you saw a man drowning, would you not risk your safety to do something about it? If you saw a person out in the water ready to go under, ready to die, would you not do something about getting in there? Would you not do something, at least throw a boy to them? Dear Christian, that is what Jesus spent his ministry addressing. A world of need, like a man drowning, awaits all of us out there. Jesus is simply asking us to use our fullest spiritual potential and to do something about it. And that is what it means to lose one's life for the sake of the gospel. Well, what can a person do? Well, sure, some of you might be thinking, well, good grief, Pastor, you can't expect everyone to be Mother Teresa. Someone's got to keep the gears grinding in this world. Someone's got to go to work every day. It's easy for you to stand in your pulpit and tell us what to do, but it's not quite as easy to be a Christian out there in this dog-eat-dog -dog world. 
If that sounds like what you might be thinking, then you really are uncomfortable with your faith, aren't you? If that's how you feel. Afraid someone's going to find you out. But if you are going to be a true follower of Christ, you are going to get found out. No one is asking you to stop the bus, however, and to say, hey, I want to get off. You don't have to walk away from your life outside the church walls to serve the cause of Christ. In truth, you are better off practicing your faith as if you were that electrical fuse. By doing your part in your corner of the world every day to make good things happen, to make life go smoothly for everyone, but still being there to help save it all if it does come crashing down. Well, how can I do what Jesus asks of me? Fred Craddock, a contemporary preacher, once pointed out in an address that he made to a group of pastors that the reality of most Christians in our country is seldom a life or death matter because of the faith that we have. For the Christian in the first few centuries of Christianity, it was, however, a life or death thing, a life or death matter to follow Jesus because it was illegal to follow Jesus. You could be executed for following Jesus. Craddock put it this way. He said, I quote, we think giving our all to the Lord is like taking a thousand dollar bill and laying it on the table. Here's my life, Lord. I'm giving it all. But the reality for most of us, he says, is that God sends us to the bank and has us cash the $1,000 bill for quarters. And then we go through life putting 25 cents here and 25 cents there and 50 cents over here. Usually giving our life to Christ isn't glamorous. It is done in little acts of love 25 cents at a time. We can't all be celebrity Christians like some are. We can't all be famous for our faith like some are. So you see, when Christ makes the statement that if you want to save your life, you have to lose it, no one really believes that what he is asking everyone to do is to just walk away from it all and to dive completely into Christianity and never be seen or heard of again. Jesus is really asking us to be his followers right where we are, each one of us, in our own lives, to be Christ-like in our little corner of the world. In other words, be the fuse that keeps Christ's message flowing. Be the fuse that keeps Christ's message alive while you're still being active among all the people of the world. Responding to that call helps us understand that the Christian mission is to serve the cause of Christ by serving well in the world. It is acting in the servant role that one finds the ego, finds the greed, finds the self-worship must all be set aside to lift high, high the cross of Christ. Well, in living that servant role, one may lose his or her life as defined by the world, but in the end, one will find who she or he really is. And that, my friend, is worth its weight in gold. To know yourself, to know who you are, especially in the light of Christ's love. Well, what am I going to get out of all this, you might be asking. So what if I decide I'm going to be a fuse for Christ? Well, knowing that finding oneself is worth more than gold, Jesus asked the question, what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? What will it profit you to have all there is to have? What will it profit you to be the richest person in the world? But give up your soul. Give up who you are. I once read an interesting statement by a missionary named James Elliott. Jim Elliott, who was martyred because of his beliefs when he was serving in the mission field in Ecuador. He was killed. And he said this, He is no fool who risks what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool to risk what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. There's no one in this room who will not die. It may be news to you, but there is. There's no one in this room who will not die. And that for certain is something that we all have in common. 100 years from now, we will most likely all be a memory, a picture in the pages of the church directory that we just photographed. That being true, 
then we should have nothing to fear in committing this one life we have to gaining the certainty of eternity. And eternity once gained cannot be taken away like life on this earth can be. Besides gaining eternity, there's also the immediate results for those who lose themselves in Jesus Christ. We become more aware of our purpose on earth. When we lose ourselves in our faithfulness to Christ and we take our giftedness out into the world to serve, we will always come away being the ones who are blessed the most. The more of yourself you give away, the greater are God's blessings in your life. That's just the way it works. It's a tried and a true principle. I remember a Rotarian from Kettering, Ohio, who had gone to be with the Lord since this time. But Bob would spend his vacations in Calcutta, India. He would go over there and he would work every year. That's what he did for vacation. He would go over in Calcutta and he would work with the sick and the dying men that Mother Teresa was taking care of. And as he told his story, you would know that Bob really did not know himself until he started giving himself away. He had to start giving himself away. I mean, the rest of us, we know, yeah, we take vacations, we go places and we play and we, and we rest and we all, but here he was giving away himself and he looked into the eyes of dying men and he served those men by helping them with their most basic needs. And Bob would tell you, he found himself, his humanity, and he was in touch with eternity. Of course, we have many well-known people out of the past like Mother Teresa, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Frank Laubach, and the list continues, who are major examples of people who, in losing themselves for the greater cause, found out what their purpose and their meaning was in life and beyond life. By losing ourselves in our faithfulness to Christ's mission in the world, we ourselves receive the greatest gift of all, the knowledge of our own purpose in this world and the joy of gaining eternity. Jesus calls us, all of us, to let go of the things that are, that are thought in this world to be meaningful and to then focus our unused spiritual energy on what the more important and the more loftier objectives are for life. Certainly, they often seem less obvious and often and they offer modest worldly acclaim. I mean, nobody gets famous for doing a good deed. Nobody gets famous for being kind or loving or compassionate. But in the overall picture, the objectives for our lives that Christ taught are greater in importance than what the world teaches. Jesus also challenges us to lose ourselves in our faith community in order to find the real person we each really happen to be. To recapture the illustration I used in the start, Jesus calls us to be fused, to be a fuse in Christian lives into the life of the world, to infuse that into the world, to be willing to act as a fuse in an electrical system would act in going, giving its life and toward the benefit and the good of the whole. Remember, Jesus is not asking anything of us that he did not do himself. I mean, after all, he went to the cross and he died. In each of us, there is a reservoir of unused spiritual energy. We need to focus our unused spiritual energy, all of us, and remember the fuse finds its purpose in life by giving its all for the whole. You have everything to gain by giving your life for all. You have everything to gain and nothing to lose by serving Christ well with who you are. Be a fuse for Christ. Focus your unused spiritual energy for the good of all, and God will bless you. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord God, there's a lot of unused spiritual energy that's just floating around this room today. There, there's all this positive, positive power that's within each of us. There's all of this possibility that we each have to use our lives to glorify you and to be stronger in our faith. And so we pray for that. But this morning also as we pray, we pray about the things that cause us to be drained. We look at what's going on in the world. We look, uh, we look upon the shooting down of a plane with innocent people on it in a war-torn land. We look at what's going on between Israel and, and the Palestinians. We look at what's going on in other places around the world and it all brings us sadness and fear and concern. God, we bring all of this before you because we come to this place knowing 
that you, God, are the one almighty God that there is, and we can come to you and bring our fears and our concerns. Help us to help the world. Help us in this world to be a different kind of people, to be more loving, to be more faith-filled, and to blend our lives together to serve you well. We ask, God, that you'd watch over each one here, watch over those for whom we've been praying, watch over our church, our city, our nation. Forgive us of our sins and bring us into a place where we know peace and justice and mercy. And help us to be those who help others. In the name of your Son, who taught us to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Through the giving of ourselves, of our time and our talent, we can extend to the world the power of God's love. And we can help to realize the truth, for the world to realize the truth that God loves all his children. Give what you can and God will bless you for giving.
are indeed grateful, God, for all that you have done for each of us in this room. We know we are blessed. We know that you have blessed us abundantly. And so we share these gifts that we bring from our homes, that we've prepared with our own hands to bless you, God, to bless your church and to strengthen it. Be with this congregation as we continue to serve you and seek to serve you well and serve you in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Savior, with grateful hearts. Amen. Eternity is now. We are living in eternity today, but there will come a day when we will fly away and be a part of it all. And God's blessings will surround us eternally as God's blessings surround us now. The problem is in our current state, we have to figure that out. We have to find it, and we have to receive it. So as you the people with the edge, the followers of Jesus Christ, go out into the world. You can know where to find that peace and that eternity. You can know where to find that love. It's in your God, Yahweh, creator of all that is and all that ever was and all that ever will be. Go work for that creator, God, and bless others with your life, and God will bless you. God's face will shine on you, and God will grant you peace. Amen. Mm -hmm. 